I'm sure everybody has seen the memes of programmers in the 1980s versus programmers now. And um, that essentially comes about through lack of constraints, which is what we're going to talk about today. So essentially the theory is like, as computers and technology, like hardware wise have gotten faster, software developers have gotten worse because we no longer have to optimize things, right? Like if you've got a, uh, like a 32 thread processor, you can get away with a whole lot more than if you're like writing code for a, like a calculator or something, which people have ported Doom to. So today I'm gonna kind of talk about like why programming with constraints can be a good thing, both for you, like as an engineer to improve um, and also just as a, as a general thing, like even in industry, programming under constraints can still be a very useful thing. So as some of you might know, I am a teaching assistant at an embedded systems course for my university. And recently this semester, the, um, we, we basically give them a project that they have to do and it's like a team-based project. So they get into teams and they have to do um, like some kind of embedded project. And this semester they had to build a waveform generator. So if you're not familiar with what a waveform generator is, it's essentially like a uh, electronic device that generates a voltage. In this case, uh, we just got them to generate voltage of um, some kind of mathematical function. So you can have, for example, a sine wave, like voltage that's like varying going up and down in a sine wave. You can have a sawtooth wave, which is kind of like a um, like this. It's also called a ramp, um, a reverse sawtooth, etc. Um, you know, and you can have uh, square waves as well, which is the typical like di digital signaling that you'd you'd see like this. This is relevant, I swear, I swear. So um, yeah, they were doing this embedded systems project, and essentially like timing was a big part of it. So we wanted them to have an output sample rate because if you think about how you'd actually go about doing this project it's pretty simple like you'd have a digital to analog converter um you'd have an amplifier circuit to get like offset and amplitude correct um but like the meat and potatoes of this thing is a, a digital to analog converter so they have a digital to analog converter but of course in order for their waveform to not look like complete garbage we gave them a output resolution requirement. So essentially the requirement was they had to output their waveform at a, uh, at a sampling rate of 160 kilohertz. So essentially you have to have 160,000 samples per second of your output waveform. Um, and this was actually a very big uh, challenging component for a lot of students. Uh, the the output waveform so um like the the sample rate so a lot of students really struggled to get their sample rate up to uh you know a, a decent amount um because we also had additional requirements like they had to um control an lcd screen as well and when you're writing to that lcd screen it's used done over spi so you lose a lot of time um and so like they were really struggling to get their sample rate up because it's like as your um you know, as you're writing to the LCD, obviously you can't output a value to your DAC. So, you know, you lose time there. So the timing was actually a really critical component of this. And one important thing to mention is that for this course, um, it's a second it's a second level course, which is like not always equivalent to like a second year course, but essentially it's like, um, it's not like a very advanced course. Um, people find it tricky because it's like a, a real industry team project course, but it's not actually, like technically speaking, it's not that um, difficult. But as a requirement, because this is a, like a, a pretty, like not a low level course, but like, you know, not a very advanced course. Uh, we say you guys can only use like 8-bit um, AVR microcontrollers. So think uh, like an Atmel, Atmega 328P, something like that. Um, you can use some of the newer ones as well. But the, the 328 is what most of them use, because that's the one that we kind of like officially support. Um, coincidentally, I think that's also the one used in the Arduino Uno, but they, they use like bare, they, they program it bare. They don't use like the Arduino libraries or anything. Um, but yeah, and, and the reason I bring this up is because after the conclusion of the project, um, I had a student come up to me and he said, wow, if we had been able to do this on an STM32, where I could use free RTOS and, you know, I put my DAC output task, uh, my DAC output uh, method as a task, you know, I can put all my sample values on a queue or something like that. Um, that would have made this project really nice and simple to do. And I told him, yeah, I was like, I completely agree. Like if you had an STM32, 
this project and and Freatos, especially for the because of all the timing involved this project would pretty much be trivial like you could do it i don't want to say in like a couple of weeks but like you know it, it would be very simple to do whereas like with the um with the avrs that we got them to use a lot of people struggled with timing um you know getting their interrupts to work correctly making sure that they weren't spending too much time writing to spi of like their lcd versus writing to uh, spi for their dax because most of them use serial dax surprisingly um but yeah and and I, I agreed with him i was like if you used an stm32 this would be a pretty trivial task but an stm32 is quite a big step up from um an 8-bit avr in terms of its its hardware capabilities of course like you know you can run a proper uh, real-time operating system on it with like very little issue so um i said to him basically like look the point is um you could go and implement this i mean like Take an, I, an Intel Core i9-3900KS. Go and do it on that. See how easy it would be if you could use that. <laughs> um, like, if you had a, you know, you had a CPU that powerful, anything really becomes trivial. So, like, the point is half... Yeah, um, like, you know, you can only use this AVR because, um, you know, it's a second-year course and we don't really expect too much from you. But on the other hand it also adds a constraint onto the project where it's like, if you think about when you're going to do something like this in industry, right? Um, you're not going to choose a chip. If you can, if it's like possible to do the project on a cheaper chip in industry, you should. Um, I mean, with like exceptions, of course, like future functionality, if you want to extend the functionality, you might choose a more expensive chip. But in general, like, um, you know, if there's a cheaper chip available, you want to be using that because when you go to mass produce the thing, you know, uh, a couple of dollars difference in the microcontroller you use is massive. So I, that's what I said to him. I was like, you know, like, yeah, you could go and implement this on an STM32 with a real-time operating system and it would be really easy. But considering that it is very possible to do on an Atmega, just a little bit more difficult, um, if you were an embedded engineer in industry, you would probably prefer to do that because of how much cheaper the chip would be to um, acquire and produce. And he, he, he like, yeah, he was like, yeah, that's, that's understandable. Um, but you can take this um, a little bit further and not just do it in like the embedded realm. So you can take this for software in general, because the meme is not really about embedded systems. The meme is more about, um, you know, computing as a whole and software engineers as a whole. So consider like high level programs, like video games, for instance. Um, has anybody noticed recently like minimum requirement creep? I, I guess that's a term you could you could call. But like, um, you know, like the minimum requirements of games, if you think about game developers, they actually have to put artificial constraints on themselves to match um, the performance of what they think the majority of gamers are going to be running. So for instance, like I'll do a little spec reveal here. I'm running a uh, 5950X, as you can see, with a 6900 XT graphics card. Like most gamers are not going to be running these kinds of specs. So if I was a game developer, even though my computer is capable of that and my dev machine is capable of that, I'm going to artificially constrain myself and say, okay, this needs to be optimized to run at like 60 FPS on a, um, I don't know, a 1066 gigabyte, kind of showing my age there with the uh, generation of card I decided to use as an example. But anyway, the point is like, you can actually get a lot of benefit by putting artificial constraints on yourself. Going back to the example before, you know, you can use the STM32 with free RTOS and it would be trivial, but you actually become a better engineer and there's a better teaching process here for the students in this particular course to learn how to do it on um, an Atmel AVR, like bare metal AVR programming instead of just like, you know, you can use an RTOS or like other abstraction layers or things like this because it teaches them the importance of getting their timing right. It teaches them, you know, how to be efficient with their calls. Uh, it teaches them, you know, instead of like having a, an Artos schedule everything for you, you know, how might you write your own scheduler to make this sort of thing more efficient? A lot of them ran into issues with uh, lookup tables. So for instance, if you were going to do this and send output values to a DAC, a lot of them use lookup tables to do that. So, you know, you have like, your pre-calculated sign values so you don't have to calculate it on the fly 
which is great, you know, because like you save a lot of time by having these values pre-calculated. The problem is if you're on um, one of these AVR chips, they don't have that much uh, memory to save these to. So like your, um, you know, you, you it, considering the sample size we wanted, which was 160 kilohertz, you have to come up with more inventive ways to get around that issue. Whereas if you had, I don't know, like a desktop PC with a terabyte of storage, sure, bro, just pre-calculate 160,000 values for like, and, and I saw this, I saw somebody try and pre-calculate for every different amplitude. Okay, so consider this, right? Like an amplitude of a sine wave, right? Um, all you have to do is take your pre-calculated sine value and scale it by a certain number. And that's your, amp that's your amplitude application. I saw someone try and generate a lookup table for every amplitude spec we required. We wanted it in steps of like um, 0.5 or something. So his solution was to scale, like generate lookup tables for every single amplitude in our spec, instead of realizing, hey, I can make this more efficient by just scaling it at, um, you know, as necessary. And that doesn't actually incur a big cost to me uh, computationally because I've pre-calculated the vast majority of this sign value. I just need to scale it by a little bit. Um, so like, yeah, that, that method, you might have been able to get away with that method on like a desktop PC where you've got gigabytes, terabytes of space. But by putting a constraint on yourself like that, um, where you say, okay, I've got an AVR with not that much memory to hold all these lookup tables in, you have to be a bit more inventive with how you go about doing these sorts of things. And that's why I think the benefit is really there. And that's why I think the memes, there's, there's a little bit of truth behind the meme because, um, you know, it's, it's true. Like if you, if I'm like programming, targeting a 32 thread CPU, my program might run like absolute garbage. Like, cause as long as my, it runs well on my dev machine, I'm not necessarily caring about the dude running it on a Chromebook, you know? Um, so devs tend not to notice, like if my code runs fast on, on my CPU, which, and I've got a beast CPU, you know, um, I'm just going to say works on my machine. I'm not going to really care about optimizing it for, for lower end hardware. So that's why I think if you put constraints on yourself, like for example, where, what I discussed today, you know, like you can only use an eight bit AVR, um, because we know it's possible to do it on that. I think you actually become a lot more inventive with your optimizations. And like, you could see this in the past as well. So I don't know if any of you guys know the fast inverse square root algorithm that was, that uh, was came up for the original Doom game, which was a crazy algorithm. There's like a bunch of great videos on YouTube about it that you should check out if you're interested. But um, crazy optimizations like that, if computers were fast enough to compute an inverse square root without that many issues, um, or like, or like the performance impact wasn't as bad on most computers, that algorithm never would have existed. So it's that kind of thing where it's like, if you put constraints on yourself, especially, and I think this was really valuable for this course because it's students, right? Like students are being taught. Um, I think you really start to understand more about optimization and especially like at a university course, you want students to be taught how to come up with more inventive ways to optimize things. You don't want them to just go for the initial naive solution that might sound great in their head, but as soon as you try and apply it with your constraints, you know, it, it, it turns out not to work. This is in contrast to another university course that I took once, which was about systems programming. And um, they basically had a server that students could SSH into to run their code, right? Um, and it was a AMD Epic, uh, it was running on an AMD Epic CPU. I think it was a virtual machine, but like one of the things was a multi-threaded server, right? It was like a pretty stock standard thread per client model. Um, and so essentially like what you'd have is people um, who would fork bomb the server because they their code was so bad. Um, and you know, people were using threads very inefficiently. They weren't really cleaning them up correctly. And the server ran uh, like, you, you know, their code, you could see it stressing the server out, but it was an AMD Epic CPU VM. Like it still went, it still ran fine. And I was guilty of this back in the day because I took this course as wow, like uh, a second year or something. And gee, it was, it was, my code was pretty bad back then as well. Um, and I didn't use my threads that well. 
but the the point is like if you let students run this on a server vm with great performance they're not really going to learn that much about optimization especially in something as critical as systems programming like if you're trying to teach systems programming you want them to do it right you know don't give them a server with 64 gigs of memory um so that you know their network like they don't really have to care about freeing memory as long as it doesn't segfault their program um or like their memory use at all because i remember like there were so many people that i talked to who's like uh you wait freeing the memory <laughs> Free, uh, what freeing them i have to free the memory like they didn't even know you had to free the memory because it wasn't an issue like for the lifetime of your program the server that you were testing this thing on had so much memory you could get away with it so um yeah it's it's like that so that's in contrast to that other course which i, I think didn't do constraints very well i think they should probably put more constraints on what like the performance of student servers and and what they have to do I think that would teach uh, a lot better for systems programming especially but for this embedded course i thought this was a really nice side effect of our requirement of you know you can only use an 8-bit avr and to be fair the project we just had i feel like was one of the more challenging that we've had recently it, just because the timings you had to be so precise otherwise you know you didn't really get that many marks so yeah i, I thought this was an interesting uh topic to talk about programming with constraints I try and do it myself. I have like, uh, you know, I'll, I'll put like performance targets on on the things that I want to do. I'll test it on. I'm, I'm fortunate in that I've got quite a, a number of different hardware um, configurations I can test stuff on, not just my like 32 core dev machine. But yeah, it's like you you want your stuff to be performant on as many systems as possible. And you can see that in game game dev, like they'll have minimum requirements that they want to target. Don't know what this grass block is doing right here, but. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Um, I think that pretty much wraps it up. The meme is kind of true, you know, like as hardware gets more powerful, you don't really have to worry about this stuff for a lot of different applications. And sometimes that really does hurt performance in, um, in a noticeable way. So that's kind of what I wanted to say. It can be beneficial for you if you put constraints on your programs. Um, maybe you could opt to try them on lower end hardware from time to time if you like. But yeah, that's pretty much what I wanted to chat about today. Cheers.